Good afternoon. Welcome. We're here to commemorate a very significant moment on April 4th, 1967. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was <clears throat> among several people who were involved in speaking to an event that was organized by a group called CALC, which was then identified as clergy and laymen concerned about Vietnam. Later on, uh, laymen became lay people and lay people in turn became laity. Calc still uh, continued to be a very, very important group for many years following that. In 1967, the United States was in the throes of ferment domestically, fire in the streets, which had been unfolding for years and years in protest to the continued oppression of black and other oppressed minorities and poor people in the United States and with an increasing consciousness of the consequences of militarism undertaken by the United States abroad. Dr. King, who was a spokesperson, perhaps the most well-known spokesperson for what came to be known as the Civil Rights Movement, had been increasingly concerned with the relationship between domestic oppression and its transnational expressions in imperialism, in colonialism, and the connection between what he considered to be the triplet of evils, racism, militarism, and extreme materialism, the causes of poverty. And his identification with the poor, with the oppressed, was consistent. And it became more and more apparent in his sermons and his speeches and his public appearances from about August of 1965, he was looking at the relationship between poverty and neglect for the underclasses in the United States and the increased expenditures for war by what had become a permanent war economy led by the military industrial complex. And so that began to creep into his presentations, into his sermons, in the very special and the unique singular way that he could so eloquently express that. So it was not a new theme. It was not a new sense of connection. But as more and more claims were put on him, and he did more and more traveling, and his time was taken by different kinds of responsibilities to different movements and organizations, it became more and more difficult for him to construct speeches and lectures and, and even sermons by himself. So he relied upon members of his circle, his inner circle, one of whom was a very remarkable historian by the name of Vincent Harding. Vincent Harding had known Dr. King since 1958. So he knew him essentially for the last 10 years of his life. 
And when this opportunity was extended to Dr. King to speak to clergy and laity concerned on April 4th, 1967, a couple of people got together and the person who took the lead in presenting, in writing down what was essentially the thought of Dr. King was Vincent Harding. So Vincent Harding was in a very great measure responsible for the text, but the text was a collective text. The text did represent the thought of Dr. King as well as the words of Vincent Harding. It was unusual in that, unlike many of Dr. King's presentations, this one, he stuck very closely to reading the text word for word. And it was not presented as a sermon, it was presented more as a lecture. And those of you who have listened to this will have a sense of that because he has a long series of passages about history, about the history of the United States relationship with Vietnam, about the history of the Vietnam Revolution, about the people who were involved in decision-making and the consequences of these interactions. And it is a very erudite, scholastic, academic presentation, which might have been a surprise to people who just thought he was sort of a country preacher, but he never was that. He was many different things. Vincent Harding himself did many presentations and he did several works, including a kind of biography of Dr. King, which talked about him as a sort of inconvenient hero. And we are very fortunate because among us is a person who hosted a commemoration of the event of the Beyond Vietnam speech through honoring Vincent Harding at Inner Light, Rev D. And I was very fortunate to be there. My partner was there as well and many other community members were. So I was very favored to have actually had a couple of conversations with Vincent Harding. At that point, what we didn't know was the end of his life. And for me, a lot earlier in the 1970s, when I first met him, when I was in graduate school at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I wanted to share briefly something that Vincent Harding shared with a gathering of seminarians at Eastern Mennonite University. And Vincent Harding was a Mennonite, among many, many other things. But he said, uh, <clears throat> Dr. King took inspiration, derived inspiration from Matthew 25, 35 through 40. And he described this in terms of a certain injunction. And he said, I choose to identify with the underprivileged. I choose to identify with the poor. I choose to give my life for the hungry. I choose to give my life for those who have been left out of the sunlight of opportunity. I choose to live for and with those who find themselves seeing life as a long and desolate corridor with no exit sign. This is the way I'm going. 
If it means suffering a little bit, I'm going that way. If it means sacrificing, I'm going that way. If it means dying for them, I'm going that way. Because I heard a voice saying, do something for others. This is what Dr. King said in 1966 in Chicago at the age of 37. So we're going to hear in its entirety the presentation that he made read by members of our community. If you have never heard it or read it before, you can find it on the web. What's really striking about this is that this is being done in communities all over this country. It has become an annual ritual. It is a celebration. It is a re... It is a a means of recommitment for those of us who are inspired by these words to be more mindful, to be more intentional, to be indefatigable in the aim to bring about justice. So, I we, all of us, are exhorting you to rise up here, be your best selves, commit yourselves to whatever degree that is possible to try to make the world a better place. Those of you who are close to finishing up Lenta, grace and peace. Those of you who are halfway through Ramadan, Assalamu alaikum, Ramadan Mubarak. Everyone who is present here, peace be unto you. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I need not to pause to say how delighted I am to be here tonight and how very delighted I am to see you expressing your concern about the issues that will be discussed tonight by turning out in such large numbers. I also want to say that I consider it a great honor to share this program with Mr. Bennett, Dr. Kamanger, and Rabbi Heschel, and some of the distinguished leaders and personalities of our nation. And of course, it's always good to come back to Riverside Church. Over the eight years, I have had the privilege of preaching here almost every year in that period. And it is always a rich and rewarding experience to come to this great church and this great pulpit. I come to this magnificent house of worship tonight because my conscience leaves me no other choice. I join you in this meeting because I'm in deepest agreement with the aims and the work of the organization 
which has brought us together, clergy and laymen concerned about Vietnam. The recent statements of your executive committee are the sentiments of my own heart. And I found myself in full accord when I read its opening lines. A time comes when silence is portrayal. And that time has come for us in relations to Vietnam. The truth of these words is beyond doubt, but the mission to which they call us is a most difficult one. Even when pressed by the demands of inner truth, men do not easily assume the task of opposing their government's policy, especially in times of war. Nor does the human spirit move without great difficulty against the apathy of conformance thought within one's own bosom and the surrounding world. Moreover, when the issues at hand seem as perplexing as they often do in the case of this dreadful conflict, we are always on the verge of being mesmerized by uncertainty, but we must move on. And some of us who have already begun to break the silence of the night have found that the calling to speak is often a vocation of agony, but we must speak. We must speak with all the humility that is appropriate to our limited vision, but we must speak. And we must rejoice as well, for surely this is the first time in our nation's history that a significant number of its religious leaders have chosen to move beyond the propicity of smooth patriotism to the high grounds of a firm dissent based upon the mandates of conscience and the reading of history. Perhaps a new spirit is rising among us. If it is, let us trace its movements and pray that our own inner being may be sensitive to his guidance for we are deeply in need of a new way beyond the darkness that seems so close to us, around us. Over the past two years, as I have moved to break the betrayal of my own silences and to speak from the burnings of my own heart, as I have called for radical departures from the destruction of Vietnam, many persons have questioned me about the wisdom of my path. At the heart of their concerns, this query has often loomed large and loud. Why are you speaking about the war, Dr. King? Why are you joining the forces of dissent? Peace and civil rights don't mix, they say. Aren't you hurting the cause of your people, they ask? And when I hear them, though I often understand the source of their concern, I am nevertheless greatly saddened for such questions mean that the inquirers have not really known me, my commitment or my calling. Indeed, their questions suggest that they do not know the world in which they live. In the light of such tragic misunderstanding, I deem it of signal importance to try to state clearly, and I trust concisely, 
why I believe that the path from Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, the church in Montgomery, Alabama, where I began my pastorate, leads clearly to this sanctuary tonight. I come to this platform tonight to make a passionate plea to my beloved nation. This speech is not addressed to Hanoi or to the National Liberation Front. It is not addressed to China or to Russia, nor is it an attempt to overlook the ambiguity of the total situation and the need for a collective solution to the tragedy of Vietnam. Neither is it an attempt to make North Vietnam or the National Liberation Front paradigms of virtue, nor to overlook the role they must play in the successful resolution of the problem. While they both may have justifiable reasons to be suspicious of the good faith of the United States, life and history give eloquent testimony to the fact that the conflicts are never resolved without trustful give and take on both sides. Since I am a preacher by calling, sorry. Tonight, however, I wish not to speak with Hanoi and the National Liberation Front, but rather to my fellow Americans. Since I am a preacher by calling, <clears throat> I suppose it is not surprising that I have seven major reasons for bringing Vietnam into the field of my moral vision. There is, at the outset, a very obvious and almost facile connection between the war in Vietnam and the struggle I and others have been waging in America. A few years ago, there was a shining moment in that struggle it seemed as if there was a real promise of hope for the poor, both black and white through the poverty program. There were experiments, hopes, new beginnings. Then came the buildup in Vietnam, and I watched this program broken and eviscerated as if it were some idle political plaything of a society gone mad on war. And I knew <clears throat> that America would never invest the necessary funds or energies in rehab rehabilitation of its poor, so long as adventures like Vietnam continue to draw men and skills and money like some demonic destructive suction tube. So I was increasingly compelled to see the war as an enemy of, enemy of the poor and to attack it as such. Perhaps a more tragic recognition of reality took place when it became clear to me that the war was doing far more than devastating the hopes of the poor at home. It was sending their sons and their brothers and their husbands to fight and to die in extraordinarily <laughs> high proportions <clears throat> relative to the rest of the population. We were taking the black young men who had been crippled by our society and sending them 8,000 miles away. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> to guarantee liberties in South Asia, which they had not found in Southwest Georgia <clears throat> and East Harlem. And so we have been repeatedly faced with the cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together in the same schools. And so we watch them in brutal solidarity, burning the huts of a poor village, but we realize that they would hardly live on the same block in Chicago. I could not be silent in the face of such cruel manipulation of the poor. My third reason moves to an even deeper level of awareness, for it grows out of my experience in the ghettos of the North over the last three years, especially the last three summers. As I have walked among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men, 
I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems. I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes most meaningfully through nonviolent action. But they ask, and rightly so, what about Vietnam? They ask if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problems, to bring about the change it wanted. Their questions hit home. And then I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. For the sake of those boys, for the sake of those governments, for the sake of the hundreds of thousands trembling under our violence, I cannot be silent. For those who ask the question, aren't you a civil rights leader? And thereby mean to exclude me from the movement for peace? I have this further answer. In 1957, when a group of us formed the Su Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which chose as our motto, to save the soul of America, to save the soul of America, we were convinced that we could not limit our vision to certain rights for black people, but instead affirm the conviction that America would never be free or safe from itself until the descendants of slaves were loosened completely from the shackles they still wear. In a way, we're agreeing with Langston Hughes, that black bard of Harlem, who had earlier written, oh yes, I say it plain, America was America it was never America to me, and yet I swear this oath, America will be. Now, it should be incandescently clear that no one who has any concern for the integrity and life of America today can ignore the present war. If America's soul becomes totally poisoned, part of the autopsy must read Vietnam. It can never be saved so long as it destroys the deepest hopes of men the world over. So it is that those of us who are yet determined that America will be are led down the path of protest and dissent, working for the health of our land. As if the weight of such a commitment to the life and health of America were not enough, another burden of responsibility was placed upon me in 1954. And I cannot forget that the Nobel Peace Prize was also a commission a commission to work harder than I had ever worked before for the brotherhood of man. This is a calling that takes me beyond national allegiances. But even if it were not present, I would yet have to live with the meaning of my commitment to the ministry of Jesus Christ. To me, the relationship of this ministry to the making of peace is so obvious that I sometimes marvel at those who ask me why I'm speaking against the war. Could it be that they do not know that the good news was meant for all men, 
for communists and capitalists, for their children and ours, for black and for white, for revolutionary and conservative. Have they forgotten that my ministry in this obedience to the one who loved his enemies so fully that he died for them? What then can I say to the Viet Cong or to Castro or to Mao as a faithful minister of this one? Can I threaten them with death? Or must I share with them my life? And finally, as I try to explain for you and for myself the road that leads from Montgomery to this place, I would have offered all that was valid if I simply said that I must be true to my conviction that I share with all men the calling to be a son of the living God. Beyond the calling of race or nation or creed, it's this vocation of sonship and brotherhood. And because I believe that the father is deeply concerned, especially for his suffering and helpless and outcast children, I come tonight to speak for them. This I believe to be the privilege and the burden of all of us who deem ourselves bound by allegiances and loyalties which are broader and deeper than nationalism and which go beyond our nation's self-defined goals and positions. We are called to speak for the weak, for the voiceless, for the victims of our nation and for those it calls enemy, for no document from human hands can make these humans any less our brothers. And as I ponder the madness of Vietnam and search within myself for ways to understand and respond in compassion, my mind goes constantly to the people of that peninsula. I speak now not of the soldiers of each side, not of the ideologies of the Liberation Front, not of the Junta in Saigon, but simply of the people who have been living under the curse of war for almost three continuous decades now. I think of them too, because it is clear to me that there will be no meaningful solution there until some attempt is made to know them and hear their broken cries. They must see Americans as strange liberators. The Vietnamese people proclaimed their own independence in 1954, in 1945 rather, after a combined French and Japanese occupation and before the communist revolu revolution in China. They were led there by Ho Chi Minh, even, even though they quoted the American Declaration of Independence in their own document of freedom we refuse to recognize them. Instead, we decided to support France in its reconquest of her former colony. Our government felt then that the Vietnamese people were not ready for independence, and we, fell, we again fell victim to the deadly Western arrogance that has poisoned the international atmosphere for so long. With that tragic decision, we rejected a revolutionary government seeking self-determination and a government that had been established not by China, for whom the Vietnamese have no great love, 
but by clearly indigenous forces that included some communist. For the peasants, this new government meant real land reform, one of the most important needs in their lives. For nine years following 1945, we denied the people of Vietnam the right of independence. For nine years, we vigorously supported the French in their ab abortive effort to recolonize Vietnam. Before the end of the war, we were meeting 80% of the French war costs. Even before the French were defeated at Dien Bien Phu, they began to despair of their reckless action, but we did not. We encouraged them with our huge financial and military supplies to continue the war even after they had lost the will. Soon, we would be paying almost the full cost of this tragic attempt at recolonization. After the French were defeated, it looked as if independence and land reform would come again through the Geneva Agreement. But instead, there came the United States, determined that Ho should not unify the temporarily divided nation, and the peasants watched again as we supported one of the most vicious modern dictators, our chosen man, Premier Diem. The peasants watched and cringed as Diem ruthlessly rooted out all opposition, supported their extortionist landlords, and refused to even discuss reunification with the North. The peasants watched as, as all this was presided over by United States influence, and then by increasing numbers of United States troops who came to help quell the insurgency that Diem's methods had aroused. When Diem was overthrown, they may have been happy, but the long line of military dictators seemed to offer no real change, especially in terms of their need for land and peace. The only change came from America. As we increased our troop commitments in support of governments which were singularly corrupt, inept, and without popular support, all the while, the people read our leaflets and received the regular promises of peace and democracy and land reform. And now they languish under our bombs and consider us, not their fellow Vietnamese, the real enemy. They move sadly and apathetically as we herd them off the land of their fathers into concentration camps where minimal social needs are met. They know they must move on or be destroyed by our bombs. So they go, primarily women and children and the aged. They watch as we poison their water, as we kill a million acres of their crops. They must weep as bulldozers roar through their areas preparing to destroy the precious trees. They wander into the hospitals with at least 20 casualties from American firepower for one Viet Cong inflicted injury. So far, we may have killed a million of them, mostly children. They wander into towns and see thousands of the children homeless without clothes running in packs on the streets like animals. They see the children degraded by our soldiers as they beg for food. They see the children selling their sisters to our soldiers, soliciting for their mothers. What do the peasants think as we ally ourselves with the landlords and as we refuse to put any action into our many words concerning land reform? What do they think as we test our latest weapons on them, just as the Germans tested our new medicine and new tortures in the concentration camps of Europe? Where are the roots of the independent Vietnam we claim to be building? Is it among these voiceless ones? We have destroyed their two most cherished institutions, the family and the village. We have destroyed their land and their crops. We have cooperated in the crushing, 
in the crushing of the nation's only non-communist revolutionary political force, the United Buddhist Church. We have supported the enemies of the peasants of Saigon. We have corrupted their women and children and killed their men. Now there is little left to build on, save bitterness. Soon, the only solid, solid physical foundations remaining will be found at our military bases and in the concrete of the concentration camps we call fortified hamlets. The peasants may well wonder if we plan to build our new at v Vietnam on such grounds as these. Could we blame them for such thoughts? We must speak for them and raise the questions they cannot raise. These two are our brothers. Perhaps a more difficult but no less necessary task is to speak for those who have been designated as our enemies. What of the National Liberation Front, that strangely anonymous group we call VC or communists? What must they think of the United States of America when they realize that we permitted the repression and cruelty of Diem, which helped to bring them into being as a resistance group in the South? What do they think of our condoning the violence which led to their own taking up of arms? How can they believe in our integrity when now we speak an aggression from the North as if there were nothing more essential to the war? How can they trust us when now we charge them with violence after the murderous reign of Diem and charge them with violence while we pour every new weapon of their death into their land? Surely we must understand their feelings even if we do not condone their actions. Surely we must see that the men we supported press them to their violence. Surely we must see that our own computerized plans of destruction simply dwarf their greatest acts. How do they judge us when our officials know that their membership is less than 25% communists and yet insist on giving them the blanket name? What must they be thinking when they know that we are aware of their control of major sections of Vietnam, and yet we appear ready to allow national elections in which this highly organized political parallel government will not have a part? They ask how we can speak of free elections when the Saigon press is censored and controlled by the military junta as they are surely right to wonder what kind of new government we plan to help form without them, the only party in real touch with the peasants. They question our political goals and they deny the reality of peace settlement from which they will be excluded. Their questions are frighteningly relevant. Is our nation planning to build on political myth again and then shored up upon the power of new violence? <clears throat> Here is the true meaning and value of compassion and nonviolence. When it helps us to see the enemy's point of view, to hear his question, to know his assessment of ourselves. For from his view, we may indeed see the basic weakness of our own condition. And if we are mature, we may learn and grow and profit from the wisdom of the brothers who are called the opposition. So too with Hanoi and the North, where our bombs now pummel the land and our minds endanger, endanger the waterways, we are met by a deep but understandable mistrust. To speak for them is to explain this lack of confidence in Western words and especially their distrust of American intentions now. In Hanoi are the men who led the nation to independence against the Japanese and the French, and the men who sought membership in the French Commonwealth and were betrayed by the weakness of Paris and the willfulness of the colonial armies. It was they who led a second struggle against French domination at tremendous costs 
and then were persuaded to give up the land they controlled between the 13th and 17th parallel as a temporary measure at Geneva. After 1954, they watched us conspire with Diem to prevent elections which could have surely brought Ho Chi Minh to power over a united Vietnam. And they realized they had been betrayed again. When we ask, why do they not leap to negotiate? These things must be remembered. Also, it must be clear that the leaders of, of Hanoi considered the presence of American troops in support of the Diem regime to have been the initial military breach of the Geneva Agreement concerning foreign troops. They remind us that they did not begin to send the troops in large numbers and even supplies into the South until American forces had moved into the tens of thousands. Hanoi remembers how our leaders refused to tell us the truth about the earlier North Vietnamese overtures for peace, how the president claimed that none existed when they had clearly been made. Ho Chi Minh has watched as America has spoken of peace and built up its forces, and now he has surely heard the increasing international rumors of American plans for an invasion of the North. He knows the bombing and shelling and mining we are doing are part of the traditional pre-invasion strategy. Perhaps only his sense of humor and of irony can save him when he hears the most powerful nation of the world speaking of aggression as it drops thousands of bombs on a poor, weak nation more than 800, rather, 8,000 miles away from its shores. At this point, I should make it clear that while I have tried in these last few minutes to give a voice to the voiceless in Vietnam and to understand the arguments of those who are called enemy, I am as deeply concerned about our own troops there as anything else. For it occurs to me that what we are submitting them to in Vietnam is not simply the the brutalizing process that goes on in any war where armies face each other and seek to destroy. We are adding cynicism to the process of death, for they must know after a short period that, there, that none of the things we claim to be fighting for are really involved. Before long, they must know that their government has sent them into a struggle among Vietnamese and the more sophisticated surely realize that we are on the side of the wealthy and the secure while we create a hell for the poor. Somehow, this, ma um, this madness must cease. We must stop now. I speak as a child of God and brother to the suffering poor of Vietnam. I speak for those whose land is being laid waste, whose homes are being destroyed, whose culture is being subverted, I speak of for the poor of America who are paying the double price of smashed hopes at home and death and corruption in Vietnam. I speak as a citizen of the world for the world as it stands aghast at the path we have taken. I speak as one who loves America to the leaders of our own nation. The great initiative in this war is ours. The initiative to stop, it must be ours. This is the message of the great Buddhist leaders of Vietnam. Recently, one of them wrote these words, and I quote, each day the war goes on, the hatred increases in the heart of the Vietnamese and in the hearts of those of humanitarian instinct. The Americans are forcing even their friends into becoming their enemies. It is curious that the, that the Oh my goodness. It is curious that the Americans who calculate so carefully on the possibilities of military victory do not realize that the process they are incurring deep psychological and political defeat. The image 
of America will never again be the image of revolution, freedom, and democracy, but the image of violence and militarism, unquote. If we continue, there will be no doubt in my mind and in the mind of the world that we have no honorable intentions in Vietnam. If we do not stop our war against the people of Vietnam, Vietnam immediately, the world will be left with no other alternative than to see this as some horrible, clumsy, and deadly game we have decided to play. The world now demands a maturity of America that we may not be able to achieve. It demands that we admit that we have been wrong from the beginning of our adventure in Vietnam, that we have been detrimental to the life of the Vietnamese people, the situation is one in which we must be ready to turn sharply from our present ways. In order to atone for our sins and errors in Vietnam, we should take the initiative in bringing a halt to this tragic war. I would like to suggest five concrete things that our government should do immediately to begin the long and difficult process of extricating ourselves from this nightmarish conflict. Number one, end all bombing in North and South Vietnam. Number two, declare a unilateral ceasefire in the hope that such action will create the atmosphere for negotiation. Three, take immediate steps to prevent other battlegrounds in Southeast Asia by curtailing our military buildup in Thailand and our interference in Laos. Four, realistically accept the fact that the National Liberation Front has substantial support in South Vietnam and must thereby play a role in any meaningful negotiations and in any future Vietnam government. Five, Set a date that we will remove all foreign troops from Vietnam in accordance with the 1954 Geneva Agreement. Part of our ongoing commitment might well express itself in an offer to grant asylum to any Vietnamese who fears for his life under a new regime which included the Liberation Front. Then we must make what reparations we can for the damage we have done. We must provide the medical aid that is badly needed, making it available in this country if necessary. Meanwhile, we in the churches and synagogues have a continuing task while we urge our government to disengage itself from a disgraceful commitment. We must continue to raise our voices and our lives if our nation persists in its perverse ways in Vietnam. We must be prepared to match actions with words by seeking out every creative method of protest possible. As we counsel young men concerning military service, we must clarify for them our nation's role in Vietnam and challenge them with the alternative of conscientious objection. I am pleased to say that this is a path now chosen by more than 70 students at my own alma mater, Morehouse College, and I recommend it to all who find the American course in Vietnam a dishonorable and unjust one. Moreover, I would encourage all ministers of draft age to give up their ministerial exemptions and seek status as conscientious objectors. These are the times for real choices and not false ones. We are at the moment when our lives must be placed on the line if our nation is to survive its own folly. Every man of humane convictions must decide on the protest that best suits his convictions, but we must all protest. Now, there is something seductively 
tempting about stopping there and sending us all on what some circles. In some circles have become a popular crusade against the war in Vietnam. I say we must enter that struggle, but I wish to go on now to say something even more disturbing. The war in Vietnam is but a symptom of a far deeper malady within the American spirit. And if we ignore this sobering reality, and if we ignore this sobering reality, we will find ourselves organizing clergy and layman concern committees for the next generation. They will be concerned about Guatemala, Guatemala and Peru. They will be concerned about Thailand and Cambodia. They will be concerned about Mozambique and South Africa. We will be marching for these and a dozen other names and attending rallies without end, unless there is a significant and profound change in American life and policy. And so such thoughts take us beyond Vietnam, but not beyond our calling as children of the living God. In 1957, a sensitive American official overseas said that it seemed to him that our nation was on the wrong side of a world revolution. During the past 10 years, we have seen emerge a pattern of suppression, which has now justified the presence of US military advisors in Venezuela. This need to maintain social stability for our investments accounts for the counter-revolutionary action of American forces in Guatemala. It tells why American helicopters are being used against guerrillas in Cambodia, and American napalm and Green Beret forces have already been active against rebels in Peru. It is with such activity in mind that the words of the late John F. Kennedy come back to haunt us. Five years ago, he said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. And I'll repeat that. Those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. Increasingly, by choice or by accident, this is the role our nation has taken, the role of those who make peaceful revolution impossible by refusing to give up the privileges and the pleasures that come from the immense profits of overseas investments. I'm convinced that if we're to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must, <clears throat> we must rapidly begin. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. A true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. On the one hand, we are called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that will only be an initial act. One day we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. With righteous indignation 
It will look across the seas and see individual capitalists of the wealth investing huge sums of money in Asia, Africa, and South America only to take the profits out with no concern for the social betterment of the countries and say, this is not just. It will look at our alliance with the landed gentry of the South America and say, this is not just. The Western arrogance of feeling that it has everything to teach others and nothing to learn from them is not just. A true revolution of values will lay hand on the world order and say of war, this way of settling differences is not just. This business of burning human beings with napalm, of filling our nation's homes with orphans and widows, of injecting poisonous drugs of hate into the veins of people normally humane, of sending men home from dark and bloody battlefields, physically handicapped and psychologically deranged, cannot be reconciled with wisdom, justice, and love. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. America, the richest and most powerful nation in the world can well lead the way in this revolution of values. There is nothing except a tragic death wish to prevent us from reordering our priorities so that the pursuit of peace will take precedence over the pursuit of war. There is nothing to keep us from molding a recalcitrant status quo with bruised hands until we have fashioned it into a brotherhood. This kind of positive revolution of values is our best defense against communism. War is not the answer. Communism will never be defeated by the use of atomic bombs or nuclear weapons. Let us not join those who shout war and through their misguided passions, urge the United States to relinquish its participation in the United Nations. These are days which demand wise restraint and calm reasonableness. We must not engage in a negative anti-communism, but rather in a positive thrust for democracy. Realizing that our greatest defense against communism is to take offensive action in behalf of justice. We must, with positive action, seek to remove those conditions of poverty, insecurity, and injustice which are the fertile soil in which the seed of communism grows and develops. These are revolutionary times. All over the globe, people are revolting against old systems of exploitation and oppression. And out of the wounds of a frail world, New systems of justice and equality are being born. The shirtless and barefoot people of the land are rising up as never, as never before. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. 
we in the West must support these revolutions. <laughs> it's a sad fact that because of comfort, complacency, a morbid fear of communism, and our proneness to adjust to injustice. The Western nations that initiated so much of the revolutionary spirit of the modern world have now become the arc anti-revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. This has driven many to feel that only Marxism has a revolutionary spirit. Therefore, communism is a judgment against our failure to make democracy real and follow through on the revolutions that we initiated. Our only hope today lies in our ability to recapture the revolutionary spirit and go out into a sometimes hostile world declaring eternal hostility to poverty, racism, and militarism. With this powerful commitment, we shall boldly challenge the status quo and, and unjust mores and thereby speed the day when every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. A genuine revolution of values mean in the final analysis that our loyalties must become econ economical, economical rather than sectional. Every nation must now develop an overriding loyalty to mankind as a whole in order to preserve the best and their individual societies. This is a call for worldwide fellowship that lifts the neighborly concern beyond one tribe, race, class, and nation. It's in reality a call for all embracing unconditional love for all mankind. This oft misunderstood, this oft misinterpreted concept so readily dismissed by the Nietzsche's of the world as weak and cowardly force has now become an absolute necessity for survival of men. When I speak of love, I'm not speaking of some sentimental and weak response. I'm not speaking of that force, which is just an emotional bosh. I am speaking of that force, which all great religions have seen as the supreme and unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks the door, which leads the ultimate reality this Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist belief about ultimate reality is beautiful summed up in the first epistle of St. John. Let us love one another, for love is God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth of God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. If we love one another, God dwelling in us and his love is perfected in us, let us hope that this spirit will become the order of the day. 
We can no longer afford to worship the God of hate or bow before the altar of retaliation. The oceans of history are made turbulent by the ever-rising tides of hate. And history is cluttered with the wreckage of nations and individuals that pursue the self-defeating path of hate. As Arnold Torby says, love is the ultimate force that makes for the saving choice of life and good against the deeming choice of death and evil. Therefore, the first hope in our inventory must be the hope that love is going to have the last word, unquote. We are now faced with the fact, my friends, that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now in this unfolding conjuring of life in history. There is a such thing as being too late. Procrastination is still a thief of time. Life often leaves us standing bare, naked, and dejected with the lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of men does not remain at flood and ebbs. We may cry out desperately for a time to pause in her passage, but time is adamant to every plea and rushes on over the bleached bones and jumbled residues of numerous civilizations are written the, pa are written the pathetic words, too late. There is an invisible book of life that faithfully records our vigilance or neglect. Omar Kamyan is right. The moving finger writes and having writ moves on. We still have a choice today. Nonviolent coexistence or violent conaliation. We must move past indecision to action. We must find new ways to be, we must find new ways to speak for peace in Vietnam and justice throughout the developing world, a world that borders on our doors. If we do not act, we should surely be dragged down the long, dark, and shameful corridors of time reserved for those who possess power without compassion, might without morality, and strength without sight. Now let us begin. Now let us rededicate ourselves to the long and bitter, but beautiful struggle for a new world. This is the calling of the sons of God and our brothers wait eagerly for our response. Shall we say the odds are too great? Shall we tell them the struggle is too hard? Will our message be that the forces of American life militate against their arrival as full men and we send our deepest regrets? Or will there be another message of longing, of hope, of solidarity with their yearnings of commitment to their cause, whatever the cost? The choice is ours. And though we might prefer it otherwise, we must choose in this crucial moment in human history. As that noble bard of yesterday, James Russell Lowell eloquently stated, once to every man and nation comes a moment to decide in the strife of truth and falsehood for the good or evil side, some great cause, God's new Messiah offering each the bloom or blight. And the choice goes by forever, twixt that darkness and that light. Though the cause of evil prosper, yet his truth alone is strong. Though her portions be the scaffold and upon the throne be wrong. Yet that scaffold sways the future and the dim and behind the dim unknown. Standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. 
And we and if we only make the right choice, we will be able to transfer this pending cosmic elegy into a creative psalm of peace. If we will make the right choice, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our world into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. If we will but make the right choice, we will be able to speed up the day all over America and all over the world when justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Sometimes there's no greater gift than just silence. And a deep breath. I'd like to take another moment to just I feel like I'm on fire and I can start speaking in tongue. That's what I feel. Yeah. 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 Hmm. I want to thank all those who are present in the world of the intangible and the world of the unseen because they're here. And all of you for being present with us this evening. I feel the room is full. Hmm. I want to give thanks to our, our readers. Yes. And I'm going to read their names in the order in which they present it. And it would be beautiful if we can wait after all the names have been spoken. I get to speak your name. Thank you. That's a gift to me. I get to speak your name. We can 
give our gratitude in return. Okay. David Anthony III. Tyree Ritchie. Elaine Johnson. Sylvia Morales. Nane Alejandres. Rev. Deborah Johnson. Isabel Contreras. Norma Alicia Pino. Amanda Harris Altis. Sarah Cruz. Cheryl M. Williams. Joe Williams. Simba Kenyatta. Nikia Cheney. Bhavananda Lotke, Isaac Collins, and Chris Davis. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn it over to the executive director of RCNV, Sylvia Morales. Thank you. Hi, everybody. We want to take a little bit of time um, for reflection. So I don't want to just limit participants, readers, I want to see if maybe we can get three, four people to reflect on impact. So in other words, how did the reading of this speech slash sermon slash lecture <laughs> impact you in this moment? Um, so we'll start with uh, anybody that wants to come up. And if you could keep it to about a minute, that would be wonderful. <clears throat> I'm going to start myself because I really um, had a really difficult time getting through my part. And in anticipation of coming here today, and I knew I was going to read for a really long time. Um, and then all of a sudden it hit me, because that's usually how things hit me, like right before they happen. <laughs> Um, it hit me that, <clears throat> I don't even know how to describe this, but what I'll say is that every single day, I feel the impact of the state. And this moment is difficult because it puts an inflection point on what I live every single day already and it's painful. So, um, and I didn't want to leave today without recognizing that for myself and also recognizing that for anybody else or anything else for anybody because moments like this are so critical for us, for those of us that have feelings, for, for those of us that live this life and this reality <clears throat> and for those of us that know the importance of this, of the work of nonviolence and the work of Dr. King. So I just want to give the opportunity for voicing those things for anybody that wants to do that. Do you want to come up? Uh, 
You know, I, I just came from uh, Salt Lake City, uh, where this black and brown man had told about the meeting today, so that they would be in, uh, in touch with us. But I was uh, as a Vietnam veteran, I was really hit with uh, the destruction of this city. He was reading that particular part really hit me in terms of that I was part of something that uh, doesn't hit. But we, uh, we involved ourselves in a struggle and just as if we did not be no more better support for the wars. And as I entered the, uh, the prison, right in the lobby there were the mural honoring all veterans, and there's like 200 Vietnam veterans incarcerated in some of the workers. But we start, we, we keep moving, we keep keeping, and it's a, it's a long term. But I, I, I was really touched by everyone. Thank you for being here today and sharing you, your, your presence and your reading and your comment just, just now. Chris. I said this to the speakers who had a meeting before this. Um, I'm the age that Dr. King was when he gave this speech. And so just like in that perspective is something I'm still processing. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to mm -hmm. say. <laughs> um, I've never read any of Martin Luther King's speeches like that. And I, I spent like the last six weeks re re reading that over and over again, and then listening to the speech over and over again, because I wanted to make sure to do it justice because those words are powerful. Everything he speaks about, it still goes on today in our environment. So to be able to read those words, it definitely was shock. It made me really take my time and not just say those words, but make sure I hear it in his voice too, so I can get it right. So for me, it was, you know, it was deep. I, I, I rehearsed on and on because I wanted to make sure that I give him the respect the right way. And yeah, so that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So I have now heard this read and read it so many times and every single time I hear something new in it. It's so rich and it's so deep. And the, the things that struck me this time were one thing in the words themselves and the other in the way that it was read by those of you that read for us. Thank you so much for that. And the first thing was the incredibly deft way that he built the comparison of the disempowered and poverty stricken in Vietnam to the soldiers that were going to fight. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, we all sort of know that story, but the way that he links them is so powerful and so unavoidable in that speech, and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And the other piece is that um, probably like most of you, I've been in this struggle a long time, and I've managed to do it by not having my emotions in front. And to watch people speak this with emotion is so incredibly moving and challenging for me. So I thank you for that, for opening up that space. Three things. <clears throat> First of all, I've been in this hall when, when we heard the speech before, and Reverend Dee was leading, and she said, this is the speech that God him killed. And as I listened today, I thought Reverend D was right on. I mean, those were, his words were too much for an hour to be and handle. And the two other things is his deep spiritual universal qualities are just incredible. I mean, and he was way, way ahead of his time. We're hearing more of that now, but, you know, this is over 50 years ago. 
And the last thing is the revolution of values that he talks about. What a what an example, a demonstration of what a true self-realized life would be like. And how hard that would be to live that out fully. I mean, a lot of us think, well, we do want to live that way. But what he was talking about is takes incredible spiritual depth and incredible sacrifice. And most of all, the deepest sense of love that could ever be in a human being. And so I'm very grateful to hear the words again. And uh, I, I just I thank you for giving this this uh, venue for people in the community to hear together. Thank you. And I want to say, especially if you're a person of color, it's difficult. Yeah. Yes. I really appreciate that you recruited all these wonderful readers to express this wonderful speech. And it occurred to me as everyone was so individual, even though we're all similar, every paragraph of the speech is enlightened by the individuality of having all these speakers. And I thought, wow, that speech in itself would be a curriculum for our high schools that would expand so much awareness in a way that we're not doing in our schools at this time. And so I'm going to see what I can do about that. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, it's so funny because I'm a teacher. And I teach letters from Merle Kennedy. I don't teach this speech. And as I was listening to everyone reading and listening to the ways in which he pushed the Vietnam War, with the concerns of what's happening, the racial concerns, the racial injustice, how mm -hmm. um, he made a call for action. Mm -hmm. These are the things we need to do right now. These are the things we can't allow. It just, it blew me away. It really just blew me away. Um, and I, I was kind of called last minute to do this. I wanted to do it before, but I thought I could mess up the email and just call people back. And I was so honored to really be able to feel and embody his work um, and his words. And I think that that's something we all do. We know who Dr. Martin Luther King is, and we know nonviolence, and we connect that, and that's all over the place, but we don't really listen mm. to what he's saying, mm. what we need to do, and the hypocrisies that are in our country, and what we actually need to start doing. Because I just, I just think it was beautiful. So I feel honored to be I, I, so I want to make a quick comment and then I, I, I see you. Um, the thing that's really resonating for me right now in, in, in the last few days about this speech and this moment and really, um, I know you guys know I'm emotional. <laughs> Every time I speak, I feel like I cry. <laughs> It's, it's the topic. It's a really hard one for me. Um, the legacy of silencing, because I'm breaking free from that. And the creation of his words and his understanding that allowed me to be able to voice things I can't voice on my own. Um, even though I have the thoughts in my head, it is an incredible thing for me to get them out of my body because I've been silenced for many generations. <laughs> so I just needed to get that out. <clears throat> Thank you. Are we still Rev streaming? Reverend Deb. Is this still streaming? Is this still streaming? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, I, I just want to connect a couple of dots here. One, that King was killed exactly a year later. So this is the anniversary today of his assassination. Okay, just let that sink in for a second. And, and the other thing is that when I say that he was killed for this speech, this, this is true, and there, there aren't any people who will argue that. But I want us to be perfectly clear he wasn't killed to shut his mouth. 
He was killed to stop us for what you just said. Because he was in the process of mobilizing the peace and freedom movement, the student nonviolent movement, the labor movement, the civil rights movement, and, all, and they were going to occupy Washington, D.C. until we got out of Vietnam. He was going to shut it down. I want you to catch that. He wasn't killed to shut him up. He was killed to stop us. And we've let it happen. I call it the unfinished business of King. For the movements to get together <laughs> and work together so that the man's living will not have been in vain. That his death will not have been in vain. <clears throat> Simba. revolution. I believe in revolution and have since I was a member of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. Revolution is not something that just happens out on the streets. Revolution, just like charity, starts at home. And the first home we have is us, our bodies. So when you think of revolution, Think of what you can do to make things change, however you do it. But revolution is always through there, always through his speech and in his actions and what he does and what we do. Revolution is something that is a sustained struggle that I think a lot of us forgot about just how sustained it has to be for how long, which is your whole life. So when I listen to him, I hear a revolution. He says it quite often throughout the speech. So however you see revolution, do it. If you join the NAACP, if you teach children in schools, remember we are revolutionaries and what we do, even how small it may be, every revolutionary act is something that we all need to do. Like I said, revolution, just like charity, starts at home, in our bodies, and in our actual homes. So when you leave here, I want that word to go resonate through your brain the whole night through. Revolution, however you define it, is necessary. Personally, I think revolution, in, I believe in revolution in any and all forms. I don't believe in terrorism, bombing people and stuff, but sometimes revolution is violent. It is one of the things he said, those who make revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. So remember that. Keep that word in your head as you go home. Keep that word in your head when you talk to your children. Keep that word in your head when you talk to your sisters and brothers. The revolution, no matter how small the act, is something we all need to do and think about. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, Cinda. Mm -hmm. You have to come up. It's a short cord. The irony for me was um, that I always said this at the beginning of the uh, war in Ukraine, was that we didn't have the moral high ground in this situation, especially looking back on the Vietnam War. And, and listening to this speech today, I did hear the, uh, how much we were implicit in, in the terror and the, and the continued colonization of, of uh, Vietnam. Yes. Oh. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Um, you can come up. 
And then uh, I think this will be the last one. Oh. Okay. Oh, I see. Um, on a personal note, um, in 1967, I was young, you know, like 12. And um, there was a lot of talk about Vietnam in my house. My brother was, he had a bad number. And uh, he was uh, 20. It, it, was, it was just a really, really very, very bad time in my family all around. He did not go to Vietnam, but he did lose his mind anyway. Um, so this speech has three levels for me in terms of time. And that first one is my family time and the ever presence of Vietnam, the party, Black Panther Party, and <laughs> COINTELPRO is what it came to be known as, um, which incidentally had been in existence a very long time before. So there's that, and it was all about Vietnam, the speech and King's work in my life. And then I grew up a little bit in 1984, Rainbow Coalition time. Um, that's Jesse Jackson, I don't know who remembers. Some do, some don't. <laughs> Uh, and, and the anti-apartheid struggle, the less sort of push in Africa for decolonization. And that was, um, a different time in which I heard this speech and was living it as a series of like bridges are possible, coalitions are possible. Um, and in fact, that's the only way that any political struggle's really gonna come to fruition, right? And that's how I heard the speech at that time. And then today, I was deeply moved. Um, uh, like this lady up back there was saying, surprisingly, yeah. So, um, about Vietnam. And Nane, when you were speaking, and then I saw the back of your hat where it says Vietnam on it, right? And, uh, and it was very real, you know? What we have wrought, this government has wrought with our vets and the militarization that persists. So yeah, it was kind of a time, time trip. And uh, thank you all, beautiful, Beautiful people. Thank you, Simba. <laughs> um, just want to quickly say, um, being in the same row, being somewhat in the same rows as all these amazing leaders, to be able to start off start off the speech was really felt intimidating, honestly, at first, because you know these are all amazing leaders that, a lot of ways, I'm blessed to look at as fellow peers and people I look up to when it comes to what they've been doing in Santa Cruz, you know, overall for the community overall. And for me um, to be here the second year in a row, to be able to uh, recite such a powerful speech in a lot of ways, you know, we reflect on the fact that this speech was one of the reasons that he was killed. But at the same time, um, a lot of these being able to come here and recite the speech comes with a lot of spiritual and emotional healing. Um, as a community organizer and community activist, um, especially given the recent struggles that we have seen, the recent climate that we've obviously been seen and exposed to, even with the admin of social media, even over live streaming, it's with the admin of social media, the things that we're currently exposed to on a daily basis, you know, it feels draining and it can feel stressful at times. So to be able to, on the anniversary, to be able to recite Mr. King, uh, Dr. King's speech, had that sense of emotional and spiritual healing, but also 
the fact that even though these words led to the unfortunate demise, it kind of gave me that sense of his words came with a lot of fearlessness. His words came with a lot of empowerment. And I think that that's the legacy that I think he truly wants us to continue on is that level of fearlessness and that level of empowerment moving forward. I think that's very important. Thank you everybody for being here. Oh, Dr. Anthony. Yes, of course. <laughs> Well, it was something that was that has already been said, which is um, for me, I guess, it was simply the um, it was really sad, I guess, to realize coming from a third world country, just in Africa, to realize that almost nothing had changed. Yeah. Um, because all the things that you say, it is still happening, uh, and with a lot of help from America. So mm -hmm. uh, that to me was just kind of like, wow, it's still so current that we could have this speech today, and it's still so relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That really links with something that I wanted to say, <clears throat> which was that the key of this particular speech, which is not just a speech, it's not a lecture, it's a sermon, the core of it is prophetic. He is speaking with a prophetic voice. And that prophetic voice is the voice that is warning. It is an admonition. It is an exhortation. But in the sense of the Old Testament, it is telling you not only what is happening, but what is going to happen if you do not take action and every single thing that he said in that speech happened. He talked about organizing other committees to support other struggles in other places. He mentioned Mozambique. He mentioned other struggles in the Americas. All of those things took place. The anti-apartheid movement, the sanctuary movement, if you remember that. So when we think about the situations that affect emigrants and immigrants today, when we think about the poor today, when we think about the unseen, when we think about the unheard, when we think about the voiceless, all of those people had their champion in the prophetic voice of this speech, this sermon. And in that sense, it puts him within the pantheon of prophets, but it makes us all responsible for doing better for making a difference. Maybe we're not all ready to put our lives on the line as he did, but any step that we take is a step for life, for us, for the present, for the future. We have to have courage as he did. That's the prophetic voice. Thank you. And uh, Peter's going to say a few words and then we're going we're gonna to end it. Thank you, everybody, for being here. It was wonderful. Thank you. I liked what Professor Anthony said at the beginning about this being a community process in a way that this speech came out of. It's a living document. And I mean, if we were working on it today, I'm sure we'd add patriarchy as the fourth evil. Um, but to me, the most powerful thing hearing at this time was hearing it in each of your lives, not just your voices, but who I know each of you are. And, and that, that interplay between those words and you all and your, yeah, just who you are and what you are in this community, that, that was really powerful for me. 
Um, we have another opportunity in a couple of weeks to hear from a couple of community members on another on lo a local story of resistance. Um, Joy Flynn and Isabella Bonner are going to talk about the Black Lives Matter actions that they initiated in 2020 here on Saturday the 15th. So welcome back for that. And now shall I welcome people into, we have refreshments. So please just, uh, you know, meet one another and enjoy. Thank you so much. Can we give a hand to the Resource Center for Nonviolence for putting this together? All the wonderful leadership. Thank you for standing for the community always. That little team was Sylvia, Bhavananda, David, and myself. And always Amanda.